Hello everybody, it's me, it's Andrew, Andrew Harvey, and I am absolutely thrilled to be joined by my conspirator in crime, my old conspirator in crime, Carolyn Baker. It's always wonderful to be with you, Carolyn. And wonderful to be with you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, sweetheart. And I, what we're going to do today is something very exciting. We're both going to talk about our new books and how they dance together. Carolyn has just produced this absolutely extraordinary book called Undaunted, which I've read three times and bought 10 copies of to give to everybody. I'm thinking of standing on the side of the street, actually, and just handing it out, because this book is a compendium of wisdom, of hard-earned, rugged, but very encouraging wisdom for getting through our truly bizarre and catastrophic times. And I've just brought out a book which seems very different, but actually you're going to find out is very deeply linked to the message of Undaunted. And it is, um, it's called Love is Everything, A Year with Hadovich of Antwerp, who's a 13th century Begin mystic and who is returning in this book for the first time really for 600 years to give us her message of being truly undaunted. And it's my hope that this dialogue will get any of you who haven't yet bought Carolyn's book to really plunge into it. And also to, my hope is to invite you to read it with Hadovich because the reason why I worked for three years so intensely to bring Hadovich out is because she is an indomitable mystic teacher of courage in the face of really terrifying odds and impossibilities. So here we are, Carolyn and myself, and I'm going to start our conversation by inviting Carolyn to read out a passage from her book. You'll find it on page 52 and then 53 and 54. A magnificent passage about the dangers of hope. Let's start there. Of course, Andrew. Um, the first quote that I would like to read that begins that particular chapter is from Vaclav Havel. Oh. And he says, hope is a dimension of the soul, an orientation of the spirit, an orientation of the heart. It transcends the world that is immediately experienced and is anchored somewhere beyond its horizons. It is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. So amazing. The next quote is from Thomas Merton, who says, do not depend on the hope of results. You may have to face the fact that your work will be apparently worthless and even achieve no result at all, if not perhaps results opposite of what you expect. As you get used to this idea, you start more and more to concentrate not on the results, but on the value, the rightness, the truth of the work itself. You gradually struggle less and less for an idea and more and more for specific people. In the end, it is the reality of personal relationship that saves everything. And then, of course, our friend T.S. Eliot, who said, I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope, for hope would be hope for the wrong thing. Wait without love, for love would be love of the wrong thing. There is yet faith, but the faith and the love are all in the waiting. Wait without thought, for you are not ready for thought. So the darkness shall be the light and the stillness the dancing. Wow. Ah. That's really taken from St. John of the Cross, too. That was Eliot's yes. reworking of St. John of the Cross. Yes. It's absolutely wonderful, yes. yes. And then there was another place you wanted me to focus. I wanted on. you to read your own wonderful text down to that last part in 54. So really go for it, Carolyn. This is one of the major themes of your book. Sure, sure. Yes, and I put this in italics because I thought it was so important for us to metabolize this. Our death grasp on oh, hope. No, no, 
one of my start after the T.S. Eliot and then go down to that. Oh, okay. the whole section, my sweetheart, because they really, we all really need to hear what you're saying. Okay, of course. One of my direct intentions in writing this book is to dismantle all forms of conventional, culturally cherished hope that the reader may have. While that may sound like a brutal admission, I assert that nothing has been more brutal than the murder of this planet in the name of our hope that climate chaos will diminish, deteriorate, or entirely disappear or that our species will mitigate it sufficiently so that it can be reversed or ended. In fact, it is our constant addiction to hope, even our pontifications that hope is our moral obligation, that have allowed us to kick the climate can down the road until it exploded in our faces. Oh my God, yes. We can thank both the chimera of certainty and our addiction to hope for delivering us to our current ecocidal destination. Addicts who have spent many years in recovery often report that while they've had some indication of what sober living could bring them, they have joyously discovered dimensions of their own being that they could not have known in a state of addiction. Full disclosure, I'm here to take away your hope in exchange for your discovery of the creativity compassion, connection, and courage that are available when you give up hope. <laughs> Author, farmer, and cultural activist Stephen Jenkinson offers a unique and exhilarating redefinition of the word catastrophe. In his superb wordsmithing fashion, he analyzes the ancient origins of the word, which are remarkably relevant to this moment in the history of our planet. Noting the prefix kata and noting the fact that it is a preposition carrying the quote, volatility, the direction, the thrust and purpose of that part of speech, it answers the question, where? Well, the answer is down or below. Mm. In ancient Greek mysteries, down or below did not mean hell, rather it meant beneath what we are ordinarily granted to see. It pointed to a descent, but a descent with a purpose. It also carried the connotation that the descent was not merely down, but also in. Greek mysteries were all about descending into the depths of the soul mm -hmm. in order to experience the sacred, the profound, the divine. And then comes the suffix strophe, whose older meaning was a thing braided together or woven or gathered in a pattern and strategy. When joined with kata, we can infer that the descent that takes us downward and inward is one that has meaning and purpose. It is not done in isolation. It is a descent into the deepest mysteries of the universe. It involves many parts of the individual psyche, as well as reciprocity and kinship with external allies. Or as Jenkinson summarizes, catastrophe means that yes, your descent into the mysteries will be a solitary one. And yes, you will have companions nonetheless. So, our current climate catastrophe is compelling us into a descent that we cannot control, that will plunge us into the depths of the mystical oh. experiences of our own sacred being. Amazing. Moreover, we are not the first humans to have experienced catastrophe, nor do we need to experience it alone. We can and must descend together with companions. Our death grasp on hope invariably precludes the possibility of a meaningful descent into the mysteries into which we are being drawn in these dangerous times. It also prevents us, or also prevents our being braided together 
or woven in community as we descend. That is such a brilliant and rugged and demanding passage. And I would love to ask you to comment more deeply on two sentences that leap out at me. It is our constant addiction to hope, even our pontifications that hope is our moral obligation, that have allowed us to kick the climate can down the road until it exploded in our faces. We can thank both the chimera of certainty and our addiction to hope for delivering us to our current ecocidal destination. Those are very strong words. What do you mean, Kevin? because they need to be driven home, I think, for people really to get the seriousness and the expansive beauty of what you're saying. Well, it's this, it's this almost um, religious belief, and I, I think to some extent it is religious, certainly from the Christian tradition, that we have to have hope. Hope is our moral obligation. How dare you look at all of this and not have hope? You have to hope in something, you, you, you know, otherwise you've just given up. And, and so we hope and we hope and we hope. And as a result, nothing significant, really truly significant has happened that will prevent climate catastrophe, you know? Um, and so it's this, this uh, chimera of certainty and this addiction to hope that has gotten us where we are. And, and so the addiction we, to, to hope is especially strong and crazy in American culture, isn't it? Absolutely. Because of absolutely. the signification of everything. So you cannot say anything severe or strong without having to reach for some glimmer of hope, otherwise people won't listen to you. Instead of really asking the question, do we need this kind of hope in this situation? And does it really help us? Exactly. You know, I, I spoke with an activist recently who said, um, I don't know what I would do if I thought that all of my activism was for nothing and that uh, parts of the species might go extinct. Uh, I just don't think I could live with that. So I have to hope that that isn't true. And so then I go deeper with that person into what our friend you know, Margaret Wheatley talks about, which right. is, you know, well, so let's, let's imagine what that's like, that there is no hope, and there you are, and all of your activism, or much of your activism, uh, has not resulted in the outcome that you were so attached to. So then you're back to meaning. So right. why did I do all of that? Right. What was that for? And right. then, we get, then we really begin to go somewhere. That's the strophe, and that's the descent, the kata, the going down into the mysteries, and then going there together with each other. Um, Absolutely. That's where we find, that's where we find meaning. Right. Not, not hope, but meaning. I have a friend who's dealing with the descent into um, dementia and into serious fragility of her very ancient mother, 94 years old. Mm -hmm. There is no hope that her mother, who is a very close friend of mine, is going to suddenly become 60 again and jump up and down and rediscover her memory. But that doesn't stop us all loving her, cherishing her, doing everything we possibly can to make her passing as easy as it can be. And so the situation is not going to be that easy. But we know that all of our acts of love are immensely appreciated by her. So that doesn't mean that we have idiotic hope that we're going to somehow miraculously revive her. What it does mean is that we find meaning in cherishing her. Yes. And on some level, she is finding meaning, you know, whether it's yes. logical, whether it's intellectual, whether it's, you know, cognitive, really making sense to her. She's finding meaning on a deeper level because of your love and kindness to her. 
absolutely and that gets to that second per, that second sentence that i really wanted you to dive into because it's so dense and so rich and it's so foreign to what most of the american teachers are selling in the bazaar of the new age and you and i both share a sense that it's a catastrophe in the wrong sense our death grasp on hope i love our death grasp on hope only you could have written something as naughty as that <laughs> our death grasp on hope invariably precludes the possibility of a meaningful descent into the mysteries into which we're being drawn in these dangerous times what are those mysteries that we're being drawn into that this kind of addictive reach after hope present prevents us really from experiencing and embodying what are those mysteries well i think the first one which we've been talking about is meaning right if if i am only focused on the outcome of this crisis uh, and I and I just hope, and I and maybe I work very hard to make it not happen. Then I am I am missing the deeper meaning that is there for me to experience in the descent. Because I have to ask, you know, I have to ask those basic questions like. Who am I and what is this about? And how did I get so disconnected from nature and, and, and each other? And each other. Right. And, you know, why is it, my God, we're all one? How did it happen that we got separated in our minds from each other? And how do we then braid together and weave? Uh, this rope ladder of going down into the descent with each other. So what the death grasp on hope prevents us from discovering is what Hadovich and I would call love. That's so right. in that great passage from Corinthians, St. Paul, my favorite passage in the New Testament, apart from some things that Jesus said, right. St. Paul says, the great the three great things are faith hope and charity faith is wonderful hope is wonderful but the greatest of all these is love is charity and i remember reading that a few years ago when i was beginning to understand that we we're in a time in which we had to help to un impossibly extreme opposites together on the one hand the possibility the real possibility of extinction carrying with us a great deal of nature and on the other hand the possibility of what we call radical regeneration in our book the possibility of a, a massive evolutionary leap which i'm also devoted to exploring living and helping people understand without illusion but when I was at my most depressed, I remember reading that passage from Corinthians and saying, oh, yes, that's it. That's what we need to reach for with our mind, our souls, our hearts, our bodies for a much greater, much deeper, much more connected experience of love that transcends both faith and hope and is the key to what this tragic descent can offer us if only we have the guts and the direction and the guidance to truly reach for it well this is a this is the point where i want to ask you andrew um because i've read i've read much of hadovich's book and i really would like you to define what you think she means by love because you know we, we, have, such, we have such a jaded notion of yes. love in particularly in american culture well let's start by saying that's one thing that Hadovich doesn't mean is anything jaded or banal or purely personal or purely human when Hadovich says in one of her meditations she's just heard a, a sermon by saint augustine and she feels this eruption of energy inside her and she feels oh my god it's so vast the whole world could catch fire and become ash in this energy she is connecting with what the great mystics of love connect with from all the different traditions she's connecting with the vast fiery power of 
divine love, the love that creates everything, the love that lives in and as everything, the love that is organizing with its mysterious intelligence every process, every event, the love that is the foundation and founding power of the entire universe. And this love, as you discover when you plunge into this book, Love is Everything, is not in any way sentimental or flattering to our human concepts of love. When you hear a lot of New Ages talk about love, they only speak of love as sweetness and tenderness and light and everything good. But the love that Hadovich connects with, the love that Rumi connects with, the love that Kabir connects with and recognizes as the essential power of the universe is a love that is beyond both what we call good and what we call evil and uses both opposites as ways of working its mysterious schemes in reality. So what the mystic, and Hadovich is a, the supreme mystic of this love, comes to understand is that divine love is a tremendous mystery that can only be unveiled as you yourself go through the different stages of the mystical path. It's not only a mystery, it's a mystery that works sometimes through horror, chaos, darkness, what we call evil, just as much as it works through everything we would like it to work with, sweetness, light, justice, tenderness, protection, and that our one real hope, she says again and again, is to surrender ourselves increasingly to the mystery of that love, the completeness, the fullness, the power of that love, so we can be infused by it and given a courage and a perseverance that lasts through absolutely everything. In other words, so we can be made undaunted by anything because love will give us the eyes to see that whatever is happening, however terrible, can from the perspective of the initiated mystic be understood as an invitation to go deeper into love and find the courage to go forward from that initiation. So what you're describing is something that I have always called um, the sacred yes, or the divine. The holy. And so um, it's hard for me, I must confess, to call it love because it is so much bigger than any definition of love that I've ever had. It's, it's, I yeah. understand, but that's why the mystic's definition of love, the one I've just given you, right. can help, because it can help take you out of even the biggest definition that you've had before that realization of how the great power of love, power that you experience in mystical experience, which is a bliss power, which unmistakably is love, because once you experience that bliss, you know that the source that is giving you that experience could not be anything other than unbelievably joyful and loving and celebratory of your whole being. And yet you have to come to understand, and this is why the mystics like Hadovich and Rumi are so important, you have to come to understand that that love is not something that you can sentimentalize in any way. It's love from the highest perspective, which works through the opposites. Let me just read you a couple of poems sure, that will allow that expanded vision and understanding of love to flower. And I think that our two books are deeply related because if what you're saying is let's go beyond hope let's go into the descent let's cover the, let's discover the mystery of compassion and community that we can only discover in descent right. what i'm saying is that that what you're saying implies something greater even than hope will be revealed to us in the descent and that is this love this enormous unifying power that can give us far deeper feeling for each other and far deeper feeling for nature and far deeper hunger for communion whatever happens right okay mm -hmm. so this is Hadovich 
if only to honour love, we could shun strange consolations and rewards. If only in love's honour we could adorn our depths with a glorious vision, in noble will and noble action. If only in honour of love we loved with love all that love loves, so her splendour were known to us, love would stream her being to us in fruition and deathless knowledge. You see, when I read that wonderful paragraph of yours, when you say, when we get over hope, we get into the descent and discover mysteries of communion and yes. compassion and interdependence, that just leaps off from what Hadovich is saying, because she's saying, yes. if only to honor love, we could shun strange consolations and rewards. Yes. The New Age has a sentimental vision of love. So love is supposed to protect us, whatever we do. Love is supposed to make everything right, whether we're trying to make anything right ourselves or not. Right. Love is seen as a doting parent whose duty is to really clean up our shit, however enormous the mountains of it are. And that is a ridiculous narcissistic vision of love, which is based in a ridiculous narcissistic human vision of love. And I think also that that notion of love is devoid of conflict. You can't have conflict. Exactly. Conflict. But I'm thinking that Hadovich being a begin in those days yes was having conflict all over the place and oh they, my god they yes. only lasted a hundred years right right kadovich is writing out of the mystical spring of the begin she's writing at the beginning of the 12th century and that was a time when the church was playing with these nice ladies the church thought that oh well it doesn't matter that they don't want to get married and they don't want to be nuns we'll let them play their little games do their laundry and earn their money and meet and sing and dance but what happened was of course that these women became fiercely independent fiercely empowered in their own glorious way and started producing the most astounding visionary work of which Hadovich is the most glorious in a way that truly pissed off the boys club. The boys club suddenly became both jealous and angry that these women were claiming their own female feminine power and amazing unique ways of approaching love and that made them want to destroy them because they realized they couldn't control them. So in 1312, after about a century when they didn't do much about them, they burnt a woman called Margaret Perete at the stake for writing what she wrote, The Mirror of Simple Souls, and that put a kibosh on the whole movement. But thank God Hadovich was able despite all the agony and opposition of her life, because you're right, she, it wasn't simply that she for, was, a, was compelled to face all of this latent hostility that flowered later. She was also somebody of an enormous passion and a sincerity herself and was thrown, not only opposed by the church eventually, but also thrown out by her own community who found her authenticity too much and wandered the countryside as a beggar and may have ended up dying in a leper colony. So, I mean, she took her own charism of passion to the ultimate length. Well, I think, Andrew, if I might say this, um, I think that, you know, there's such a delusion in the New Age movement oh. about conflict. Oh, my you know, God. If there's any conflict or there's any disagreement, love isn't happening. Love isn't present. Absolutely. And in fact, you know, you look at John of the Cross, you look at Teresa of Avila, and many of the mystics, they had conflicts going on everywhere. Inside and, and outside. They, yeah. yeah. They didn't just sit and, you know, in lotus position, meditate and feel bliss and love all no. around them all the time. Well, the idea that love, if you understand, that's what the great advantage of having some grasp on this monumental divine understanding of love 
is so important because if you understand through the testimony of the great mystics that this love is itself a, an op, a coincidence of opposites it works with agony as well as joy and chaos as well as order and madness as well as sanity it works with anything it can get its hands on right. in a completely free way to do whatever it wants to do from the depths of its own mystery that's the love the mystics are talking about so it makes any sentimentalization of love by any so-called mystical system or any other system ridiculous it's simply not facing the reality that love is always creating which obviously has both death and life agony and joy in it interbraided on every level and one of the strengths of the passage you wrote about the rewards of going beyond hope is that the descent that it then creates for us, demands of us, is a descent in which we can discover this mysterious fusion of opposites. And that's what I wanted to talk about next, because one of the things you return to, not obsessively, but with tremendous intensity and clarity in your book, is something that I know you feel very deeply about, and that is the necessity in a time as dramatic as ours of learning how to hold the tension of opposites. And I would love it if you would talk about what you mean by learning to hold the tension of opposites and how it refers to this time particularly and also how it refers to discovering your undauntedness your ability to fortify yourself at the deepest level because it's something that we both share in different ways so deeply and then i'll read a poem by hadovich in which he talked okay. absolutely about these paradoxes in a way that i think that you're going to recognize vibrantly well, you know, it is holding the tension of the opposites that makes me or anyone undaunted. And that expression, holding the tension of opposites, comes from Carl Jung, uh, you know, who, who spent, you know, early in his life as a child, he, you know, he was in an attic up there playing with little images and you know, had a lot of conflicts going on in his life. And those playing with those images helped him resolve and be with some of those conflicts. And then after he split from Freud, he had sort of a breakdown, you know, an emotional mm -hmm. breakdown. And, and so what he discovered out of his pain is that when you can hold on one side, the beauty, the joy, the love, the possibility, and over here, the suffering, the pain, the darkness, the not knowing, the uncertainty, you can hold those in the same body. And, you know, maybe, maybe you don't hold them at the same exact moment, but one minute it's this and one minute it's that, and you go back and forth with those. And that's a very big job to hold all of that in the same body, to hold what we see every every two minutes on the on the TV screen, the forest fires, the extinction of animals and other species, um, the the floods, the Arctic ice melt, the horrifying devastation of our planet, and over here, on the other side, the beauty, the vastness, the amazement, the awe the love, the sentimental love that we experience yeah. in our lives, the companionship, the friendship, the romantic love that we experience, the kindness, the caring, all of the good things about human beings and our planet. And we hold those in the same body. We don't say, oh, it's all crap and it's going to hell in a handbasket and I'm just going to take a lot of drugs, or I might just kill myself, or over here, oh, this is just all an illusion. It'll be fine. Everything's wonderful. Yes. <clears throat> Neither one of those is true. Right, because they, they must, must be held together. Right. They must be held together. Yes. They, they, 
They travel together and need each other. They appear together because the uh, reality is, as the great image of the dance of Shiva, reality is simultaneously creation and destruction. It's happening yes. both yes. at the same time. It's, Absolutely. it's chaos and order. It's darkness and light. That's reality. But what happens when you hold these tensions, when you prepared, as Jung said, to hang on the cross of these opposites, what happens then? Because that seems to me to be the key to your book and to Hadovich too, because she faces these opposites in her journey to love with unbelievable nakedness and authenticity and refusal to celebrate either one or the other, but to live them both together in a mystery of union. What happens through that union of these opposites? Well, you know, Jung was a, an enormous fan of alchemy. And um, alchemy was the transformation of baser metals into gold. It's metaphorical. And so he used that metaphor throughout his work. And what the alchemists did in their transformation process was hold, you know, these baser metals alongside the refined metals. Right. And then from that, the transformation to gold took place. Right. And so what happens in us as we hold the tension of the opposites is suddenly, you know, sometimes blatantly we'll see it in the flesh, but suddenly something in us is transformed. And the gold in us begins to come forth in through a way, the through the holding of the tension that could not come through. Right. And he just said, well, I'm going to focus on the good parts of me. You know, I'm going to focus just on love. We've got to have the darkness in there to help us transmute and when that transmutation happens, it creates something much more beautiful than just focusing on sentimental love all the time. Right. And this is the benefit of the mystical definition of love, which works through the opposite, so that when this terrible tension is tearing you apart, if you can have some mystical experience of love using those tensions to create a masterpiece, an engulfed masterpiece out of you, then you can find the undaunted courage to go through the whole damn thing, however painful it will be at moments. Absolutely. I Once you understand what the what Jung understands from the alchemist that Negredo is essential to Albedo and Rubedo, that you cannot get the higher unions that the alchemists were looking for, either in metals or in themselves, except by passing through this intense experience of the tension of opposites once you really understand that and further understand that that's love working it's not your sentimental love but it's divine love working in ways that you may not understand at the beginning but if you align to it it will reveal itself as merciful and transformative beyond anything you could ever have imagined absolutely and you think that the theme of what you're saying in Undaunted, you're saying, look, we're in a very extreme situation, which could very well mean our extinction. But if we approach that situation only with rage or despair or worse paralysis, we won't discover the gold that is potentially in that situation, a gold that can only emerge when we develop the strength to hold these unimaginable opposites of potential extinction or potential engulfment regeneration. That's the key to your message, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. And, you know, I think much more strength is available to us by holding the tension and experiencing that transport, that transformation, transmutation, than if we were just focusing on love. When it's sentimental. On, not, on, not on love, on our, our sentimentalized version of That's love. That's what I mean. Isn't yes. Love. Yes. Because that cannot sustain you through no. the no. real 
no. onslaught of what's really dark, really chaotic, really painful. If you're just sentimentalizing love and turning all your attention to that, to what you call the light, you will never find the fortitude to be able to withstand the assaults of yes. the terrible things that are actually happening both inside us and outside us. Absolutely. Yes. So you'll never know how strong you really are until love has worked with its opposites to birth you into the new unity that can only be born from this tension. Absolutely. Let me read you from Hadovich because she really knows this. This is on page 257 of this great woman and I absolutely love this poem. This is an absolutely astounding statement of these paradox working through the mystical notion of love. What is sweetest in love is her storminess. Her deepest abyss is her most ravishing form. Lose your way in her, you touch her close. Die of hunger for her, you eat and taste her. Love's despair is certainty. Love's most brutal wounding, her all-healing grace. Wasting away for her is to be in her peace. Her hiding is finding her always. To languish in her is to glow in health. When love conceals herself, she reveals what we can know of her. What she keeps back are her gifts. Wordlessness is her sublimest speech. Being taken prisoner by love is total liberation. Her most savage battering is her most tender consolation. Her ruthless robbery is vast profit. Her vanishing is her drawing near. Her most profound silence, her sublime song. Her fiercest rage, her dearest thanks. Her most frightening menace, pure faithfulness. Her grief, the melting of all grief. That's perhaps the greatest expression of the way in which these paradoxes in reality work to forge the undaunted, humble, engoldened self that doesn't need hope in the old sense because it knows itself fortified by the real because it's undergone this crucifixion of the tension of the opposites and being resurrected as the philosopher's stone, an embodied, humble, divine human being, quite able through that experience to meet whatever happens with more connectedness, compassion, grace, and kindness. You know, I love what she says about grief and in in this process of holding the tension uh, of the opposites of what's going on in our planet, um, I am finding that one of the most healing and powerful experiences, and I think necessary experiences Absolutely. that we have, is grieving. Together. Grieving together. Grieving the losses of our planet. Grieving the losses that are all around us. You know, when we see the you know, the mass shootings, when we see uh, the forest fires. When we see we, the crazy people, the fascist thugs trying to destroy yes, democracy. Yes, the, absolutely. the terrible things that we have to see, yes. yes. And so allowing ourselves to grieve and not saying, oh, well, that's all an illusion because everything is light. No, it's not a freaking illusion. It's the truth and we need to grieve it because Grieving brings us life and liveliness and ultimately joy. Absolutely. Grieving brings us each other. Yes. Because when we yes. grieve together, we come to love each other in a much tenderer, more compassionate way. If you're saying to somebody, don't grieve, it's an illusion, what you're really doing is preventing yourself from feeling with them the pain that you should also be sharing. And if you were sharing it, you would be so much closer to your true self, to their true self, and you'd be 
imbued with the connectedness and the compassion that would light your whole light up, life up and would bring you in the end, as you say, a much deeper form of joy. Because grief is love. Yes. You could love, well, St. Francis says, uh, love grieves like a bird sings. Love suffers like a bird sings. Yes. With love comes loss. With love comes danger. With love comes vulnerability. And with love comes grief. But without love, what are you going to live? So what would you like people in the end to leave with when they've read Undaunted? What would you like people to leave inspired to become and to do? You asked those two questions which we discussed in our first interview. What a, the question is not whether we're going to get through or that we all hope that some miracles will happen or that something will be reversed, but what are we going to be and what are we going to do? What, what's your personal answer at this moment in your life from your own undauntedness. What's your personal answer? Well, let me just refresh folks, uh, you know, if they didn't hear the first interview, the two questions that I weave into the book throughout are, who do I want to be? And what did I come here to do? As we, as we consciously open our eyes to this horrible global crisis that we're in. And, and so as I hold the tension of the opposites and I sit with those questions, what did I come here to do? Who do I want to be? Um, that informs me of how I should approach this crisis, how I should perceive it, and what I need to give. Yes. What, what qualities, what yes. gifts in me are being called for? You know, this is an assignment. Yes. And the question is not how is it going to turn out? The question is, how am I going to turn up? <laughs> yes. Right? Yes. And how you turn up may, it plays an indispensable part in how it's going to turn out. Absolutely. Because, right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and how so, do you feel you do turn up? How I feel I turn up is in the work that I'm doing every day, um, as, as uh, you know, in my writing, in conversations like this, in the um, courses and workshops that I offer, um, you know, and in the ways that I serve and that I support people around me who are doing sacred work, all of that. Um, and then just to, you know, I live in a very beautiful place. I, I live right at the edge of the Rocky Mountains and I'm, you know, 10 minutes from being lost in the forest. Uh, this background behind me is just a background, but I could go up 10 minutes from here and be in this very kind of background with no one around. And sometimes I do. And, you know, it's like to savor all of that. And at the same time that I'm savoring it, I'm grieving the loss of it because it's going away. But and that I, makes it even sweeter, more intense, more amazing, doesn't it? Yes, it certainly if you does. have this full certainty that it's all going to be okay, you miss the absolute, the exquisite, passionate beauty of something that could very well vanish. And the same if you ignore this right. situation, which most people on the planet, I believe, are just ignoring climate catastrophe. It's a concept in their heads, but they don't feel it in their guts consciously. Now, I believe everyone is feeling it on some level. Oh, of course. On a, you know, on a and it's conscious. causing all of the madness and trauma yeah. that we're acting out all over the place. Uh, but when we don't allow ourselves to really see it, then we miss, we miss all these incredible gifts. And Just when we don't see what the other great theme of your book, the rise of authoritarianism, if we're not, if most Americans, it just 
boggles my mind. Don't see what is happening right in front of our eyes, the creation of the infrastructure for a fascist state. But if you don't see it, you don't appreciate the freedoms you still have and, and rise to do everything you can to protect them because you know that if there's any chance of any solution for our crisis or a predicament, it can only come from a democracy, it can never come from an authoritarian state. And even if we are meant to go extinct, we will go extinct more gracefully only in a democratic cradle because authoritarianism is disgusting and naked and terrifyingly powerful and vicious. And also, um, you know, I like to make a distinction between the view from 35,000 feet and what's happening on the ground. Right. From 35,000 feet, yes, climate catastrophe, um, potential extinction, you know, the thinning out of the human population and on and on and on. Um, you know, and, and so for that reason, some people say, well, it doesn't really matter what's happening on the ground because collapse and, uh, you know, this demise is going to happen. And so the hell with anything but else. That's a complete cop out, isn't it? Right, Truly. a complete cop out. It's a and so, cop out is saying it's all an illusion. Yeah. Right. And the, and the view on the ground of what's happening day by day is important because that's where we can offer our gifts yes that's where we can make it a more humane demise a less brutal demise you know i do believe the demise is happening oh um, yeah but i want to make it less brutal by being aware and and yes being an activist being involved in uh fighting for democracy and exposing authoritarianism and, you know, one half of this book is about the climate crisis. The other half is about the tyranny that, oh, yes. you know, that we're walking blindly into, as Americans particularly. So, you know, that's, that's the full subtitle, which is, uh, you know, undaunted, uh, you know, engaging intentionally with climate meltdown in an authoritarian world. Living fiercely in decline. Fiercely, yes. Right. And it, your point, the deepest point in what you're showing is the deepest point in Love is Everything, Hadovich's great poetry, which is that if you accept the conditions of what is actually happening and meet them from the fullest depth of your whole being, tuned to truth, to the sacred, then even if it turns out appallingly, you will have lived a profoundly meaningful, generous, magnanimous, loving, noble, joyful life. And what a paradox that is. Well, as I, as I mentioned in our last conversation, you know, Stephen Jenkinson says these terrible times, we can look at them either as an affliction or as an assignment. And so if I'm fully present to this crisis, living constantly the question, who do I want to be and what did I come here to do? Then when it's all over, whatever that looks like, I can say, I did my assignment. I completed my homework. Let me end with Hadovich completing her homework. Yes. This is one yes. of her last poems when she really describes the ultimate revelation of love and the ultimate revelation that all mystics and perhaps all human beings are looking for. It's the last poem in this book, Love is Everything. All hail, primordial source in ourselves that gives us noble divine knowledge and feeds us always renewed love and detaches us in your wisdom from every external accident. The unity of the naked truth, abolishing all reason, holds me in this emptiness and forms me to the simple nature of the eternity of the eternal essence. Here of all thinking I am stripped bare, and those who have never truly understood scripture would never know through reason how to explain what I have found in myself. 
boundless, no veil remaining above all words. So even in the most extreme situations, or perhaps especially in the most extreme situations, we can discover through undauntedness and through the magic and the power and the grace of a love beyond any definition that we've ever had of love, we can discover this boundless freedom that we really are. This is why the mystics are so essential for us. And this is why I believe that it would be a wonderful experience for anyone who's brave enough to read both Undaunted and Hadovich together with all of the themes that Carolyn so brilliantly and groundedly brings out being re-experienced just as brilliantly and groundedly in the great majestic work of this 13th century woman who's returning now to help us discover our undaunted, boundless, free nature, whatever happens. <laughs>